Please welcome Taylor Black. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's funny, Steve made the joke yesterday about how nothing kills an environment like being told you're the professor, so nothing kills the environment like, let's talk politics. <laughs> so we are going to get straight into it. My name's Taylor. Again, I'm the digital fundraising director at the NRCC, so I oversee all of the digital fundraising space, whether it's email, text, advertising. Any channel that is digital comes to me. Um, the purpose of the NRCC and what we do, we are a member-driven organization that works to elect Republicans to House seats across the country. So the political space is a little different. Just to kind of give you guys an overview of what we do, the committee is a legacy program, but what a lot of our campaigns are doing are they're basically miniature tech startups. They start at the beginning of the cycle with a 24-month runway to basically raise as much money as humanly possible with as little assets no name ID, no money in the bank. Their job, they raise millions of dollars and then on election day, they drive it into the ground, they got no money left. So it creates a very interesting environment and a different strategy for how we scale up and how we market across channels. So I'm gonna talk about how email and SMS have really become one and the same for us and how we use each channel not to compete with one another but how they complement each other. Um, so let's just take a lay of the field really quickly. So um, political text messaging really came into the space in the 2018 cycle. Politics and digital marketing for us was never the same once we got into texting. So 2018, we've seen just a skyrocket in this particular platform, one that we just can't ignore and that we want to make sure complements what we're doing across other channels so that we're creating a very unique experience, very personal because politics is personal. We want our donors, our voters, our volunteers to feel like they're getting a very unique experience when they're speaking with the NRCC and with our candidates. So the thing about SMS is we see a really high engagement rate. Email, we see the market average of about 20% open. Text message is gonna be much higher. It's 90 to 98% with the reaction rate being also much higher with three out of five customers responding within the first five minutes. So we're picking up a lot of data really quickly, much faster than we would on email. So being able to understand those insights and carry it across channels is really important for us. Um, the second being 61% of marketers still aren't on SMS. That's even lower for political organizations. Again, we're working with the 24 month time frame with little assets. It's really tough for, you know, Joe Schmo for Congress to go through the heavy lifting to set up SMS, go through verification process, a process that may take a couple months when they're really only dealing with 24 months to survive. So it became, becomes a very heavy lift. It's something that we as the committee are trying to be helpful to our campaigns. We've launched programs like GOP Envoy, which is a very easy to use texting platform for our campaigns. They can get up on really quickly within a week on 10 DLC. They're using a long code to start texting voters, supporters, texting people where their nearest voting location is, asking if they're voting, being able to communicate with people where they are via text message. Um, but this also creates a really large gap somewhere where a legacy program like the NRCC can really shine. Because it's so tough for political campaigns to kind of break into this in a short time frame, it creates a lot of room for us to play to be able to kind of dominate this space and be really effective and cut through the clutter on text message. But as we know, email remains king or queen, whatever scenario you want. We still are looking at it for the most um, interactive content. We, 90% of content marketers are saying email engagement is the number one source for them, that's where we stay. Um, if you're looking at breaking news, any kind of press release, we still look at email first to kind of roll out those campaigns and that kind of content. Um, we also deal in the political space, skews, our donors skew older and they still prefer email. So we see that kind of preference narrow cycle after cycle as our donors get more comfortable with hearing from campaigns and committees over text message that skew, is skewing towards text over time, but email is still king, so we treat it as such. All right. um, so we asked the question, of the people that are receiving both emails and texts, 
how many of that overlap? We look at it as kind of like a Venn diagram. You've got the folks on one side who live and die by their Gmail calendar. You've got everyone else who can't put their phone down. What do you do with the people in the middle who are doing both? We found that 55% of our base is receiving both texts and emails from the NRCC. So we looked at that issue, we said, how do we create a custom experience on both of these platforms in a way that makes people feel like they're having a conversation with either their favorite candidate, a politician that they like to hear from, how do we create that special experience for them? So we looked at the process. The traditional omni-channel process was, what we would do is we would take a campaign or a topic and we would flood the plane. We would take the same content, the same idea, put it out on uh, three different channels. We kind of flipped it on its head and we said, all right, what if we try three different campaigns on one channel, see how it performs, see what it does, see what the engagement and the feedback looks like, and then roll it out to secondary platforms. And we saw a lot of success with this. We were able to create a conversation and a narrative with donors that wasn't just regurgitating the same content across different channels, but was creating a conversation. So what do those conversations look like? I was told you guys really like to see examples. So we're gonna get into examples of what the NRCC has done to do this, what the political space does. So you're gonna be examples, see examples of both the left and the right. Just to really exemplify, this is a strategy that's been rolled out and has been really adopted by the political space in general. So the first, we rolled out a text message from one of our favorite staffers, Maddie. She sent out a text to our donors letting them know that we had a really important fundraising deadline coming up. Turns out, people loved getting texts from Maddie's, it, Maddie. It was a huge hit. So what we did is we took that text message, we put it in a, a screenshot of the text message, and sent it out as a follow-up from Congressman Dan Crenshaw. So we, we were able to roll this out across multiple mediums. Instead of just taking that text from Maddie, putting it in email format and sending it out, we did a follow-up. We created a conversation of, hey, Maddie texted you, because we knew this person had received our text message, was able to put that into email as a follow-up. So that creates the same kind of organic narrative that we, you would get with, say, your friend invites you to their 30th birthday, they send you a paperless post email, and you still haven't responded, so they screenshot it and say, text it to you, and say, hey, I invited you to my birthday, are you coming? That's something that happens really organically that we try to recreate in the political space, because when we're also sending from real people and well-known figures, we want it to be a conversation. So this is the most straightforward example of how we use email to amplify text and text to amplify what we're doing on email. The next, similarly, going back to our favorite, Dan Crenshaw, this is a voice memo that we sent out over SMS. We sent out what it looks like a really organic voicemail. People can listen to an audio clip. It, again, it performed well over text, so we flipped it on its head, rolled it out as an email, came from yours truly, Taylor, at a House Republican headquarters saying, hey, I wanna make sure that you saw this voicemail that Dan Crenshaw left for you. So again, creating this conversation, this follow-up narrative where you send one type of content and then immediately follow up on a different platform that you know your donors are interacting with on both, so you're not sending the same content. It's creating this follow-up. So going to how we use t email to amplify what we're doing on text as we're trying to build our text file constantly because we really feel that that's where donors are interacting most with political campaigns. So we see both passive, we call it passive and active strategies of getting people to join your text list. This is really straightforward. This is a demo organization all on the line. They send great emails. They ask people simply, if you're on our active house file, why don't you sign up for our text updates? Really straightforward ask. We see like you have great first party data. You know these people interact with your emails. The, they're the best people to ask to sign up for your house text. It's affordable, you're already reaching out to them, and if they know your brand and they interact, the odds of them signing up to receive text updates are pretty good. It's a lot better than going out and prospecting, trying to find new people, then you have to brand educate, you kind of start them and bring them in on a new process. The best people are the people that are already getting your emails. The odds of them engaging with your text content are really high. So this is an active strategy, and then I'm gonna move to kind of a passive strategy that we see. So on the left, email footer and receipt emails, this is what we kind of call dead space. It's stuff that you have to send out no matter what, right? You're gonna have to have an email footer. On the political side, there's a lot of disclaimers. You're gonna have opt-out language. 
uh, an address and an FEC disclaimer, those are all givens. Here we see Val Demings running for Senate in Florida using that footer to advertise her tax program. So she's got this really great looking graphic. She's even got a merch cell in there as well. So if you're gonna have to include these in your emails, you might as well use it to amplify what you're doing on a different channel. Same thing, this is what we also do on receipt emails and abandoned cart emails. Things that are automatic that I feel like most people kind of overlook and they leave, it's a set it and forget it kind of channel that you can actually use to remarket. We see the most likely donor is someone who's already donated. Donors usually donate about three to four times per cycle, so that's our best channel for fundraising. So if you're going to donate and you're gonna get a receipt email, why not ask people to also sign up for text message updates in that automated email? So these were kind of passive. You can actively ask people or you can just kind of include these options in places where you normally wouldn't be remarketing folks. Okay, so flipping it and using texting to amplify what you're doing on email. This is a really um, successful strategy that we've seen of kind of doing what we saw in the first example of following up with a great text with an email. This is the opposite of that. So you have the, you have Elise Stefanik on the left following up with on uh, an email from Steve Scalise and on the right you've got Joe Biden following up on an email through the DNC. So this is both a left and right strategy that we see a lot of taking the exact creative that you sent out an email but sending it in an MMS version. So going into MMS, if anyone's on a political list right now, the odds that you've gotten a multimedia messaging service text is really high. So we started out being really heavy in the SMS sending platform. You're capped out at 160 characters here, which makes it really tough to add context and understanding of what your brand and who you're talking about is doing. So we've seen greater success with long for email style where you can really tell a story but with a text message format that allows for quick and easy response, a lot of data, and a high open rate. So this is a great example. Caroline on our team sent out an email, uh, had great context of what was going on at the NRCC that day, what our fundraising goals looked like, how we were being outraised, be able to create a story and a narrative that far exceeds an 160 character limit. So what we did was we took that really successful email that told that great story, added an image, and added that context over text and the high deliverability rate and the active engagement that we get on text messaging. So we have a lot of great candidates with really great stories that don't fit into 160 characters. Whether it's Young Kim, the first Korean American woman elected into Congress, or Brian Masta, wounded combat veteran in Florida, we have so many great candidates with so many great stories that really wanna share that with folks who want to be told, talked to on text message. So this is really where we see the space going and it's a really great opportunity to take the success that you see me on email and translate that into a text message format. Um, again, uh, I think. Uh, so how do we implement this? There's a couple different ways that we've done this and the ways that we looked at implementing the strategy and how it's really effective. So the first is a best in class CRM. We really um, have tightened down on what our donors are interacting with, how often they interact with us, where they are, making sure we're meeting them where they are, um, and understanding the kind of content they engage in. So anecdotally, we ran a contest around the Super Bowl where we were running uh, a chance to win a football sign by a federal official. So we ran the contest, it was, super, it was super successful. We picked our winner and then we really nailed down to it and we took a look. That winner had, only, had given to the NRCC before but they had only interacted when they received content from that particular federal official. Any email that was signed with him, contest done with him, we were able to identify the exact content that he wanted to receive, so we were able to tailor that. The same thing goes when you're trying to move messaging across. Us being able to identify that 55%, the middle of that Venn diagram of who's interacting on both platforms was incredibly important. So we could make sure that we weren't regurgitating content, but just on different platforms, that they really worked seamlessly together and we were creating a very unique conversation with donors. Second, data-driven decision-making. The unique thing about political is that we do a lot of scale and we do it very quickly. So our team is able to sit down every single Monday and Monday morning quarterback the previous day's content and how it performed and be able to roll content out that day depending on what we saw the previous day. This may seem really short-sighted for a lot of long-term brands who are launching seasonal campaigns, 
but in the political space, we don't have the time to plan that far ahead. Things happen so quickly and it allows us to be really reactive, which goes into the part about our swift approval process. To be able to move things really quickly, get things approved, rejigger content, we can get things approved and out the door like surprisingly fast. Uh, when we had a certain billionaire buy a certain platform not too long ago, we were able to get a text and an email out in less than 30 minutes. So that's hugely important to us and being able to make sure that we have stakeholders in the space who value what we do and understand what we do so that they can usher through all of our content so that we can get it out the door is really important. Um, so we talked about kind of what the strategy looks like, how we got there, a couple of examples and the process that we have to implement this strategy. Um, and the big question is, does it work? Um, so we see that when we do this type of messaging cross channel and we create this conversation, we get higher conversion rates. People who interact with both email and text from the NRCC are much more likely to donate when they feel that they're getting a very custom experience. Um, and that also creates a holistic brand experience as the NRCC, people are getting content custom to their behavior. If they get a text message, they will also get an email that won't be exactly the same, but will complement each other and will not compete across channels. Um, and then an increased understanding of our donors. We really like to meet people where they are, serve people text who wanna get text, and serve people email who wanna get email, um, and to be able to give people content that they wanna receive. And then diversification of content, just going back to, we try really hard not to regurgitate campaigns across different platforms, but to create custom content when we do move folks from one channel to the other. And then data-driven decision-making. This has been really effective for making us hone in on what's working and what's not. Again, we don't want that set it and forget it. We let it go. We really will switch gears really quickly to see what's working, what's not. If we have a text message that's working really great, we can say, all right, how do I turn this into an email? Am I gonna resend it? Am I gonna do a forward? All right, let's take that creative, let's put it in an ad, launch it on Facebook and Google within 30 minutes, and we can go and flood the plane on cross channels, but with unique content. So, all right, any questions? That was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quest questions? First, I want to commend you. That was an incredible presentation on the facts and how your strategy is, and I thought it was really, really well put together. Um, how do you, in a political environment, deal with cadence controls of you're sending text, but each of these candidates are sending text? Are you controlling all of that from your program, or because I mean, if I think about my inbox, it's freaking. I mean, it's nuts, right? Yeah. How, how do you handle that from a preference, from a churn, all those things? That's got to be a huge challenge for you. Yeah, I, it's a huge challenge. It, it is one of the things that we, we have this conversation of all the time of previous cycles, we were a big fish in a small pond. Well, the pond is getting bigger. The fish are getting bigger. We say we're fishing in the Mediterranean and now there's all these boats around me. How do we get into the Atlantic? How do we spread it out? Because it's become a volume game. And that's something that we talk about all the time of, it is great and we want so many more campaigns to get involved in digital because we believe that digital is the future of political fundraising. So how do you complement that with what you're doing? So ours is really donor retention, how we treat our donors, donor behavior, and making sure they're going on a journey that scales them back. So is it you've recently donated and we're not gonna send you an email probably for two to three weeks just so that you get a break, right? You've, you've previously donated, we're, we know you're gonna donate. You donate three to four times per cycle, so we definitely wanna reach out to you again, but we're not gonna do it immediately. We also, like, this the place that we're going is we know that you donate, but maybe you only donate on a presidential cycle. Maybe you only donate when there's someone running for president and you're not really into house fundraising. Maybe we serve you specific content that you know you do want. So I can't control what everyone does. To answer your question really simply, no, we can't. I can't tell someone stop sending so I can send. Um, but it is definitely a battle between the amount of content and the scale because there are just so many more people in the field now. So it's really just about content moderation and creating these conversations to cut through what other folks are doing. Taylor, are you seeing more uh, higher opt-out rates on the MMS, longer messages at all? Is there any indication that, that it's bothering people? 
No. Or that they actually like, that, that this, is, this is a medium yeah. they're actually comfortable reading longer stories in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a huge rise in it. I mean, like, uh, I've seen it both on the left and on the right. We see more interaction, higher conversion rate. I think that's something that we want to get better at in this space is getting the feedback on opt-outs because a lot of times the feedback we see is how many people are clicking or opening or um, donating, right? Because that information is immediate for us. We don't always get the back end to see what the immediate opt-out rate is, and that's just the difference between email and text. And I think there's a lot of space to grow in that medium of getting the the bad feedback where sometimes we're only seeing the good feedback. But the good feedback we're seeing is a higher conversion rate, more interaction, more money raised with MMS. And I really think it's just because of the content. People like seeing email. They like reading stories, especially when they're getting them from a federal official. They want that long form. They want to be talked to. And 160 characters is, is just not enough. We got a couple. Uh, have you experimented with, uh, sorry? Yeah, I, I'm uh, Nick Permar from Netcore. Have you experimented with uh, Apple Business Messaging or Google RCS? We haven't. We're really just sticking to SMS and our house texting. The second kind of space we really get into if it's not SMS is going to be peer-to-peer -peer text messaging, and there's a lot of political platforms that enable us to do that, but I'm going to look into it now. Jen Capstraw, Women of Email. Um, it's my understanding that political email, SMS, so forth, is a First Amendment right. It's free speech, mm -hmm. and you do not have to honor opt-outs and unsubscribes. So I'm wondering how you, are you honoring them? How are you managing that? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk to people who don't want my content. So like, we very much want to talk to donors who want our content. Um, complaint rates are an issue, obviously, across the space. Some people are better at it than others. I don't know a lot of people in the field who will who will say that they're not honoring opt-outs because it's a lot of money for me to spend on someone who doesn't want to talk to me. Like I really want to talk to the people who are opted in. We're very strict on TCPA compliance. Um, so that's super important to us in making sure that we're honoring people because again, texting, it's a reason why a lot of campaigns don't get into it is it can get expensive really quickly. So I don't want to spend the money to talk to people who don't want our content. So we're really serious about honoring opt-outs. And I think at the beginning you kind of alluded to the idea of like burning down the list, like through the cycle. Like you're not trying to retain from one political cycle to the other. You're just yeah. trying to maximize that one cycle. Is that accurate? Yeah. So when we talk about maximum burning down means in terms of spend, right? So like you spend a lot of time creating this list. Email health is super important for us. We are going to be here cycle after cycle. So making sure those people who donated six years ago are also still interested in our content now. That's why we kind of have, have moved towards this diverse conversation with donors. Um, the burn down is really more of our, our house campaigns, and it's in terms of spend. So they raise a lot of money to be able to do ads, voter outreach, pay for staff at the end. And the goal is to spend as much as you can on voter outreach so that by election day, hopefully you're successful and you've spent all your money to get all those persuadables and to make sure people are getting out the vote and voting for you. Oh. I love these questions. So fun. Chelsea Meisner from Chipotle. Um, I haven't seen retargeting based off of a voicemail before. Are you able to have visibility on whether someone listened to that voicemail and retarget or what are your KPIs look like for that? So our KPIs on that, we're actually able to do it through our platform. So we send everyone to a donation page and are able to house that data on the donation page. So it's a little bit of a workaround where it's not an exact voicemail, but we're able to put that audio file on a donation page and then track from there. So it creates that kind of look and feel of a voicemail without sending an actual voicemail. Um, I would love to get to a place, maybe that's my next Shark Tank idea of how to retarget and send people voicemails and then track from there. So if anyone wants to go in on that with me after this, maybe we have our next idea. My new channel. <laughs> Taylor Beck, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys.